we'll go ahead and get started and uh, a lot of a lot of ground to try to cover today. We'll see how far we get. Uh, anyways, as always, let's uh, let's open in a word of prayer. Uh, dear God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you in Christ Jesus' name. And Father, we're thankful once again for your blessings, for your faithfulness, for your love that you've allowed us uh, uh, allowed us to gather together again to study your word, to draw closer to you. And uh, we're in such need. We pray that you cleanse our hearts and our minds. Uh, Father God, that you lead us by your spirit. Uh, lead us in, in a spirit of wisdom and understanding and truth. That Father God, you would be glorified. The Lord Jesus Christ would be lifted up. And Father, we'll be edified, corrected, instructed, directed, uh, and conformed into his image. We ask it all in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Laodicea. So we finished up last week, and we hopefully you guys got a really good understanding of when he says that he is the amen, the amen, that he is the exact representation of what? Father. Of the Father. That there is not a, you're never going to get something different from the Lord Jesus Christ than you are going to get uh, uh, from, from the Father, right? You'd never get a, a, a difference of the opinion, uh, which is another reason why it says I and the Father are one. Which is exactly what we say, uh, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Uh, so we see the, the similarities there, how we should be united. Uh, so with that being the case, how much of the Bible should we be obedient to? All of it. <laughs> I mean, I know that the answer is simple, but practically speaking... Uh, should I look at any portion of the Bible any different than it was given to me uh, in Christ? No, absolutely not. And uh, so when he says to the, to the church in Laodicea that he is the amen, okay, he is, you know, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So maybe it's going to make an impact on them on how they're going to view this correction because it's pretty serious what he's talking to the church in Laodicea, right? And then we talked about Archippus, right? We talked about uh, the, uh, the, who we believe that in the apostolic constitutions, uh, already in, at the very early part of the church, uh, the belief was already that Archippus was the elder or the pastor of the church in Laodicea, okay? And so this is who, more than likely, who the Lord is directing this, this letter to, uh, uh, but not only did he say that he was the amen, uh, what's the next thing? He says he's the, the faithful and true witness. Uh, do you remember what the word witness is? Let's pull this up here. Faithful. What in the world is happening to my... I don't know how I got this. Let me back this up a second. I don't know how they got the inflected portions on the left side and the English on the right side. I, uh, here we go. So, okay, uh, martyr. So, witness is uh, uh, martus. Martyrs, that's where we get martyr. Uh, how did it morph into that? What was the meaning? Uh, a faithful and true martyr. Someone that believes so fiercely in something that they're willing to do what? that they're willing to die for their faith. And so that's how that word morphed into that meaning that you believe something so strongly that you're willing to die for it. And so the Lord is not only the amen. He's not the ex only the exact representation of the Father as we saw in Colossians, as we, as we saw in Hebrews, as we saw in the Gospel of John, uh, all throughout the Scriptures, but he's also the faithful witness. Turn to Hebrews chapter 3, and let's look at, uh, at a comparison of Jesus being faithful and Moses being faithful. The first six verses of Hebrews chapter 3. And we looked at the words faithful and, and, and true, but I want to look at this witness again one more time. Uh, verses 1 through 6. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession, 
He was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was in all his house. For he has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. But just as much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things uh, which were to be spoken later. But Christ was faithful not as a servant, but as a what? But as a son over his house. Whose house we are if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. Uh, in Sunday school class, uh, Charles asked, Charles Blass asked, he goes, well, what does he mean by house? What does it mean that we're his house? What does that mean? How do you see that? Dwelling place. That, that, that we're his dwelling place? Okay. Remember, I think last week we also looked at, uh, no, no, not last week when we were finishing up uh, Philadelphia. He said that those that overcome, they would all be pillars in the temple of his God. And, we, and then we looked at First Peter where it said that we as living stones are being built up. And so when we talk about being the house of God, what are we, what are we talking about? Yeah, the dwelling place. It's us, all the believers we make up the temple of God. That's where, he, that's where he resides. And so Jesus was faithful as a son. He's the faithful witness. Uh, so if he's faithful, if he's a faithful witness, well, what does that tell you about him? That you can trust him. You can trust him. Uh, not going to fail us. You can count on it, right? Uh, and, and he's been showing us this through all, all, of, his different, all of his different titles, uh, the true one, the faithful one. Uh, and now, not only is he the amen, he's the faithful and true witness. Then he goes on to say the last thing that he mentions about himself, that he is the beginning of the creation of God. Okay, the beginning of the creation of God. What does that make you think of? Does that cause any doubts or any confusion? I mean, is that, uh, does it... Uh, <laughs> Be honest with me because, I mean, I, I need to know uh, uh, this passage right here has been the source of a lot of uh, discussion, dissension, uh, disagreement in the church for many years, even today. Yeah, some, some would say that it means that he did not exist until the beginning, but really what, it, what I think it means is that he himself was the creator. Okay. Uh, so, according, like you said, according to this, uh, there was, in the early church, there was a man by the name of Arius, uh, a teacher, um, uh, a biblical teacher in Alexandria, uh, Egypt, uh, with a tremendous uh, following, and, and he was solid for, for in, in most of his stuff, but he took this verse to say that, see, he cannot be divine because he had a beginning, and actually, let me... Let me uh, give you a little bit of what he said. Uh, according to, the, to his understanding, if Jesus was the beginning of God's creation, then that means he was created by God and therefore not divine. Okay? Uh, this was in the early 4th century, which means in the, in the, three, in the 300s. Um, and so that is what is known as the Arian heresy that the church dealt with at the beginning. Okay? But can you see from reading this where you might, you might see that? Okay, so we're going to look at this. Uh, so if we look at beginning uh, and look at the word, he was the beginning. All right, you guys see that? Archie, Arche, Arche. Uh, and so the meaning of that, you click on it and we'll take a look and see. Uh, so when you're looking here at, uh, on the Blue Letter Bible, and it usually refers to the King James translation count, this word is used in the New Testament there 58 times. See where it says total 58, little x, it's used 58 times, okay? Uh, it's interpreted by the word beginning 40 times. Eight times principality, two times as corner, one, uh, let me see, I think another two times is first, and then another miscellaneous six more, six more times, 
Okay, so that gives you an understanding of how the context in the context, the translators are telling you uh, how that's been used. Okay, so in case you didn't know, that's what that block is there for to let you know. There you go, you learned something new, right? Okay, so now let's go down here to, uh, uh, and then it gives you an outline of biblical uses, how, how it's used throughout uh, the Bible, the beginning, the origin, the person or the thing that commences something, the first person or thing in a series, the leader. And then if you go down here to the definition, now we get to the actual Strong's definition here, Arche, uh, from Greek, from the Greek root word number 756, and it properly after a commencement or chief uh, in various applications of order, time, place, or rank, the beginning, corner, first, magistrate, power, principality, principle, or rule. So that should leave you thoroughly confused saying, okay, now you've told me all that and I really now have no idea which one of these I'm going to use in the context of that. Okay? Well, so we're going to spend a little time here so that you know what he means that Jesus Christ is the beginning of the creation. Okay? So let's turn to John chapter 17 verse 5. Seems like at some point at least once Every other week, we always go to John chapter 17, the high priestly prayer, right? We end up there for some reason or other. Uh, so Jesus Christ, in his high priestly prayer, he's, he's getting ready to pray for the disciples and those that he's leaving behind and so forth. And he says something interesting in verse 5 of chapter 17 of the Gospel of John. He says, now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you when? Before the world was. Okay? So he's saying, okay, uh, uh, so we know he's in his incarnation. Now he's ready to return to the Father, and he says, okay, now, Father, glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the world began. So now I'm ready to go back and take that position that I had with you before the world began. Right? So now what does that tell you? So if you put that he's the beginning of creation and that he had glory with the Father before the world was ever created, you start saying, okay, well, there's either a conflict in, in, in uh, that they're, they're contradicting or my understanding is not what it should be. Because Jesus Christ himself makes the statement that he was being glorified, he was in the presence of the Father together with the Father before the world was ever created. So that's one little nugget that we have here to help us uh, understand this, right? So let's go to Hebrews chapter 1. First three verses. Powerful verses. So in Hebrews chapter 1, the first three verses, here's what the writer of Hebrews says. God... After he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets, in the, in the prophetic books, right? In, in the prophets, in many portions and in many ways. In these last days, he has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Man, you need to have that underlined because he said what? What about the son? He appointed the son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. So who? So in, in, the, in Genesis, when it says that God knelt down and he formed man of the dust of the ground, according to Hebrews, who's the one that actually bent down and did that? It is Christ. It is Christ. Through whom he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory, the exact rep representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. What is holding this universe together? The word, the power of Jesus Christ himself. The word. Oh, wait a second. In the beginning was the word, <laughs> and the word was with God, and the word was God. Wow. And the word became flesh. When did the, now, this word that is God, this word that upholds the entire universe, when did this word that is God become flesh? In the incarnation. And so John is able to say, we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten Son of God, right? And so uh, we see in, in Hebrews chapter 1, these first three verses, that yes, Jesus Christ, 
the creative force of God. Turn to Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 14 through 17. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 14, it begins and he says, In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Who is it? In whom do we have redemption? Christ Jesus. Um, he, Christ, is the image of the invisible God. Remember the amen we talked about last week? He's that image. He's the exact representation. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were what? Created. Created. So when he says he is the firstborn of our creation, then he says that he's the one that he, he created all things. All right? The firstborn of our creation doesn't mean that he's the first thing being born. No. <laughs> the correct understanding of that is that he is preeminent above these things. It's talking about his preeminence. Okay? His higher, he is before all created things. Not that he is the first created thing. Total misunderstanding uh, uh, of that. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of our creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. We just, once again, we're confirmation of what we just said. So, now you've got some more scripture to tell you what about the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? He was there well before any of this, right? Well before any of this. So, when God says in chapter 1 of Genesis, let us make man in our image. After all, who is this us? The it is the Trinity and Divine Council at the very beginning uh, of uh, uh, of the history of man of creation, right? And so, of the Trinity, which one is it that we're seeing now that actually created all things? Christ. Now, not on his own, because we know that Christ does absolutely nothing on his own. He does exactly what the Father says, and he executes his will perfectly because they are united in, 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 their, uh, in their wills. All right? So, just so we have a, a, a good understanding, let's look at one more verse. Let's look at 1 Peter 1.20. 1 we'll look at 19 and 20. Actually, 18, 19, and 20, just so that uh, sometimes I just assume that <laughs> it all makes sense to everybody, but uh, so that we don't assume anything. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. He was foreknown... Before the foundation of the world. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world. So the word foreknown is pro-gnosko. Okay. Uh, gnosko means to know. Okay. Gnosko, to know. Uh, pro is like our prefix, pre, which means to know ahead of time. To know before. To know ahead of time. Yes, ma'am. Can you spell that gnosko? G i n o s. K-O, gnosko. Now, that's the transliteration of the Greek, right? Gnosko. Uh, the way I remembered it when I was studying it, gnosko, I know so, is how I knew that it meant that I know. <laughs> actually, I made that one up myself. This one, this one actually wasn't. Gnosko, I know so. So, pro-gnosko means to know before, to know ahead of time. Okay, so what does that mean? So, Jesus Christ was before the foundation of the world. Okay, so now... With that, all these things being said, knowing that he was there before, knowing that he was the creative force, how do you understand Revelation chapter 3, and I think that's verse 14, 
I mean, yeah, verse 14, that he was the beginning of the creation of God. He was the creator. He was the creator. All right. He was the master builder. Okay. So in the, in the mind of God the Father, okay, when it's time to bring about the creation of the world, what was his starting point? Jesus Christ. There is your beginning of the creation. The creation, the Alpha and Omega, it begins and it ends with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you begin to understand the magnitude. Why do I say all this? Because there is a, something that we really don't promote as much as we should. The Lord Jesus Christ says, how will people come to the Father? No one can come to the Father except by me. And we looked at this last week when, when, uh, uh, when Philip said, uh, hey, hey, Lord, can you show us the Father? Man, Philip, have I been with you this long? You're still not getting it? I'm the amen. I came here to show you because no one can see God the Father and live. And so in order for you to understand, guess what God the Father did? He sent the amen. He sent me in human flesh to show you, reveal, reveal, you to, to, uh, uh, reveal the Father to you. Is it not amazing that the Lord didn't say, well, that's a good question, Philip. And, and you know what? If you just keep pursuing, you know, God, one of these days, God the Father will reveal himself to you. No, you know what he said? God the Father has chosen to reveal himself how? Through me. Through me. Through the Lord Jesus Christ. You will not. Okay, so when the Lord says, if I be lifted up, what will happen when Christ is lifted up? I will draw all men unto myself. Why am I making a big thing to do about this? Is because you cannot elevate the Lord Jesus Christ too high. <coughs> Can't do it. Do you know what pleases the Father? Do you know what pleases God the Father? When you worship His Son, love His Son the way He's supposed to. The one that He sent. Okay? Man, I'm telling you, you can't, you and I can't think higher of Jesus Christ than what He is. You can't come up with a scenario where he is so great that, no. I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of man the things that God has to You can't come up with a better thought of Christ than what he really is. You can't. Okay? You know what's really great about this is that God, the Father, recognized our human limitations and our ability to believe in an unseen God so he sent Christ yes. so that we could see and come to an understanding that then it makes it possible for us to see the unseen. Absolutely. And that's when we start getting that understanding. So, it, but, but Satan would have you sit there and try to pursue some unseen nebulous thing and so forth instead of, uh, John says, we touched him and felt him with our own hands. This is who the word is. Man, we spent time with him. And so when he becomes that real to you, how is God going to become real to you? And you got to spend time with Jesus. you got to spend time with the Lord. Man, what a difference that, that will make. And so the beginning of God's creation, when God decided that he, God the Father decided that he's going to begin creation, it begins with his son. It ends. With, and you know what's going to happen at the end? Turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Man, this, this is such a tremendous passage of, uh, of Scripture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it talks, this is talking about the resurrection beginning at, at, at verse uh, 20 and, and uh, uh, 23. But verse 24 is the one that I want you to, to, to zero in on, on this train of thought, okay? Uh, because this passage is talking about the resurrection, but in verse 24 of 1 Corinthians 15, he says, after all this, he's talking about the resurrection, the different resurrections. Then he goes, then comes the end. When he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, 
when he has abolished all rule and all authority and all power. At the very end, when it's all accomplished, after the millennial reign, after the battle of Armageddon, when the last enemy, death, has been destroyed, when Jesus Christ has put all enemies under his feet, what will he turn around and do? Here you go, Father. Fulfilled your will. That's why he's worthy of praise, and that's why the 24 elders and the living creatures and so forth bow down and cast their crowns because it says, worthy are you to receive honor and glory and power and dominion and so forth. Because what? Because you have redeemed men for God from every nation and tongue and so forth. He's worthy. He's worthy. We keep the right perspective. Keeping the Lord Jesus Christ at the... Uh, 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 at the forefront, <laughs> the Bible even tells us, looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. How do you grow in your faith? Looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Absolutely. And so we see... Uh, that the beginning of the creation means that, yes, he is the beginning, the beginning point. Then we get to verse 15, and, he, and the Lord begins uh, going with the same usual format that he has done for the other, uh, for the other churches. And he, he lets them know that he knows their deeds. He has intimate knowledge uh, 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 of them. And he says that he knows their true condition. And, and, he, and he begins by telling them that, uh, I know your deeds. That you are neither cold nor hot. Uh, so the word hot is the word zestos. What it means is boiled, hot. Uh, and so figuratively speaking, it means fervent. It describes a person that is spiritually fervent, that they are on fire for the Lord, so to speak, right? Uh, Robert Thomas, L. Thomas, in his commentary, here's, how, here's what he says, and I love this comment. Hot describes a person characterized by a healthy spiritual fervor. The picture is one who has been heated to a boiling point at some out, by some outside force and has maintained that state. Um, so when you're thinking of spiritual fervor, what are you thinking? Someone, so we say, well, someone's on fire. Someone's, you know, passionate. passionate. Great word, passionate. Fervent, passionate. Does that seem like, okay, but that's kind of unrealistic to maintain that. Is it? I, no, I'm, a, I'm asking. <laughs> no. If it, if it is, then, <laughs> then I think we're all lost. No. I, mean, I can't imagine... Not, not being passionate for Christ. I can't. Ah, I'm glad you said that. I love that. I don't know the layout of sin sure did have, didn't have a problem, not, you know, and we'll, and we'll talk about that uh, and, and so forth. But uh, uh, that at some point by an outside force, that person has become burning, they, they, they become fervent, they become passionate, and they've maintained it. Uh, so when, when the churches have been told to, to stay watched, to be on guard, to always... Isn't that what he's telling them? Make sure that your love doesn't die. Make sure that you don't slip up and, and, and let your guard down and so forth. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in relation to, uh, to human love and uh, what lukewarmness uh, looks like. Uh, so the word cold, cycros, means chilly or cold. Uh, Okay, okay, very good. So cold is the exact opposite of hot. So they're polar opposites, right? So basically, if you, when you're describing, and, and obviously we're not, looking, we're not looking at the Bible and expecting someone to say that that's, uh, uh, that that's Kelvin or, you know, uh, that, that, that it's uh, absolute zero or whatever. But so when we're talking, generally speaking, we're talking about hot or cold. Cold means the absence of the absence of heat. The hotter you get, if you are hot versus lukewarm, that means the absence of cold. 
right? So they are, they are opposites, and we need to keep this as mu- in mind as the Lord is beginning to reveal this to them in their spiritual state. Why? Because a lot of people really get mixed up on what he means by this because it seems kind of odd on first in- in- inspection that the Lord would rather have someone cold than lukewarm. Does that make sense or not? Yeah, because he wants them to put their whole heart into it. If you're going okay. to come, you know, do it as much as you can. You know, okay. As as you can or whatever, with the passion or whatever. Okay. You know. But there again, the Bible says we can't do anything without him helping us. So the, Jesus and the Spirit has to help us be hot if we're going to be hot. Right. Well, I think he'd rather have someone cold than lukewarm because cold, they're a definite no. I have no part in Christ. I want nothing to do with him. That's a definite. Someone who's lukewarm, it's like, yeah, I believe in Christ, but let's just kind of keep that under the lid. You know? you don't really, we don't want to rock the boat. There's okay. too many unbelievers here. I don't want to make you and, and so we will look at lukewarm and the, stati- the, the, the state of lukewarmness spiritually, and does that represent a Christian or not? Because, boy, the the the... the the commentaries go uh, in, in different directions, and, we'll, and we will look at that, uh, and absolutely, uh, it, it absolutely makes sense. Okay, so look at verse 15, and I want you to notice something that the Lord says, and I want to get your take on this before we dissect it. I know your deeds that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. Now, I want you to tell me what you think about the Lord saying, I wish. So the word I wish means, uh, the translation is, would to God. So, man, would to God that it were this way, or or would to God that it were that way. Putting our free will in there, he wants us to choose to be. Okay, so so your take is that as soon as you see that I wish, because. I'm just kind of getting. No, 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 I, I want you to think because, okay, how is it that the Lord of glory The amen, the creative force who who calls it into being and maintains it is wishing something. Now, is Jesus capable of wishing something that's contrary to the will of God? Okay, good, right? So, all right, so one of the things that we look at when we're studying the scriptures is that you need to know the character of God and interpret the scriptures in light of the character of God. So when he makes a statement of I wish, you, you sit there and go, well, well looky there. I mean, there's there some things that he's not able to do. Um, uh, well, when, one thing is, when it, someone says, oh, God can do anything. Uh, well, I beg to differ. You know, <laughs> the Bible says that God is not a man that he should lie. Okay, God is incapable of lying. There's some, can God do anything that's contrary to his character? Absolutely not. Impossible. Impossible. Okay? And so, uh, so... That he's he's saying, look, if you're if you're cold, then then people know where you stand, and you really don't have an influence on on the Christians, the believers. But if you are lukewarm, you hurt Christianity because your testimony to the unbeliever is so weak and willy nilly that you're actually doing more harm than good. So, who's going to bring in somebody to 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 faith? Bring someone to faith if if their demonstration of faith is so weak. So when you when you read this verse and the Lord says, "I wish you were either one or the other," uh, in a minute we'll take a look at. And Kathy, you made you made an interesting point. You said that if someone were completely cold, okay, which represents a state of lostness, okay. It's easier to convince someone who is completely lost of their need for Christ than for someone who believes in Christ but thinks that they're spiritually okay in the situation that they're in. You know, uh, I'm okay for right now. Uh, Yes, I know there's more out there, and I may get to it at some point, and I may do, but right now with all the things that are going on in my life and so forth, you know, this is just good enough for right now. It's hard to convince that person that they're in a terrible spiritual situation situation in a very precarious spiritual situation it's much easier to convince someone that's cold of their sin the result of it 
And what God has done, it's easier to convince someone's cold. So I believe you're absolutely correct when he says that, yes, I would rather you be this way or that way. Because right here, by the fact that you're saying lukewarm, there is a degree of warmness there. And you can't get away from that. And so it's interesting when I read some commentators, they say, well, by lukewarm, they mean that they're on their path to God, but they haven't quite made it there yet. Uh, I think you're really, really stretching uh, because the admonition that is being given to the church in Laodicea is to the church. And we looked at the validity of the church uh, in Laodicea. Then later on, we're going to see in just a few verses where after Jesus corrects them and tells them how to get this thing straight, he begins verse 19 by saying, those whom I love, I, repro I reprove and discipline. They're in a relationship. And when we, when he, when we get to the word love, Man, I can't wait probably next week when we get to the word love. And I want you guys to look it up this week. Because of all the words of love that there are in the scriptures, whether it's agape or phileo or eros or storge, of those four loves that the Greek talks about, tell me which one he's using right here. Not right now. You look it up because you're going to be surprised. And at first you'll think it's, now wait a second, that's not right. No, it's absolutely correct. And so when he talks about lukewarmness, no, he's talking about genuine believers. There is a degree of heat there. They have believed in him. But because of that lukewarmness, they're in a bad, bad situation that needs to be uh, uh, corrected. Um, so back to his wish. Okay. Is it, is it not? I mean, it's not necessarily saying anything about character if you look at it as him saying that he, he feels for them. Okay, so let me give you another verse that you've heard plenty of times before. First Peter. Uh, God is not, or Second Peter, uh, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Okay, God is not willing that any should perish, but are people perishing? So what does that tell you? Tell me something about the heart of God. God is not willing that any should perish. When he talks about the parables, and one of the disciples says, Lord, why do you always speak in parables? Because seeing they don't perceive and hearing they don't understand. Because their hearts have, man, this is a key word, because their hearts have become dull. Lest seeing they should perceive and understand and, and hearing they, you know, they, they listen, they should hear and understand and turn and I would what? Heal them. His desire is, do you know how easy it is that we think that, I read the Bible, it doesn't mean anything to me. I didn't get anything out of it. Um, David Jeremiah, I believe it's David Jeremiah that's teaching uh, there's got a teaching right now going on on the falling away, the apostasy uh, in, in, in the church. And he said that it's happening all across the country. And he talks about this pastor that said that he was having a spiritual struggle with his, with his faith and his marriage and so forth. And so you know what this pastor decides to do? He's going to take a break from God for a year. He's not going to read his Bible. He's not going to pray. <laughs> and, and at the end of this year, what do you expect happened? Well, you know, God didn't speak to him and, and so forth and so uh, 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 whatever, right? Okay, let me tell you something. You will seek me and find me. When you seek me, how? With your whole heart. So Daniel, and this is uh, uh, in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel Starting in the very first verse of chapter 9, he says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, <laughs> we were just talking about that, right? Uh, uh, the son of Ahasuerus of Midian descent, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely... 70 years. So he's reading from the prophet Jeremiah, right? 
And as he's reading Jeremiah, he learns that there's something that in these 70 years, the, 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 uh, the, the chastisement and so forth, the penalty for their sin is going to be complete. And then look what he says. So I gave my attention to the Lord to seek him how? By just, yeah, I just did a casual reading. I was drinking some coffee, you know, and uh, I decided. No, he said, so I gave my attention to the Lord, God, to seek him by how? Prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Now tell me, is he seeking God's will with his whole heart? Has he put his entire being into it because the people of Israel, God's people matter so much to him. He wants to find out exactly what. And then you know what we find out? We find out that what he was doing upset Satan so much that he sent someone to block him from getting the message. And when Gabriel finally gets there, he goes, you know that the moment you prayed that prayer, the answer was already on its way. When you seek him with all your heart. So when God says, I wish, I want you to understand something about the will of, uh, about the will of God, about the heart of God. God is not willing that any should perish. When you look at Ezekiel, when he says, do I take pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord? And not that he turn from his wicked ways and live, so turn and live. This is Old Testament God, right? This is not, this is not like you're going to get something different in the, in, in the New Testament, but the heart of God is for what? When, when he called Abraham from among all the nations, and he goes, you will be a blessing to, to who? To all nations. God's plan had always been for all of mankind. For God so loved the world. Man, that's why I, I find it so hard when someone tries to tell me that God only loves a certain sector and not, the, and not the other. That's not the character of God. That's not what I see time and time and time again from Genesis to Revelation. As a matter of fact, turn to the last, last chapter of the Bible. Revelation 22, verse 17. I mean, we are only four verses from the very completion of the Bible. And what is this last message that the Lord says? The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who what? Wishes. Let the one who wishes take the water of life, what? Freely or without cost. The one who wishes. So tell me about the Lord saying, I wish you were one way or the other. What is it that you understand about that verse? That's his desire. Tell me about the desire. I wish. Now, so the responsibility for the response of the call of God falls squarely on who? The response to the call. Now, if you will just respond, now the Spirit will come and aid us and strengthen us and help us because the Spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. Lord, I believe, but help thou. I am. You see how the Scriptures come together and begin to, 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 to just uh, 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 confirm, confirm the truth? And so he wishes. Yes. Absolutely. And whoever decides to come to him, he will in no wise cast out. Okay. And so we see the desire when he says, "I wish." that you were hot or, hot or cold. and Why? So now he says that because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because, so he's, he's going to talk now a little bit more about their spiritual state. And let's look at verse 16 because I need you to see this. By the way, if you guys notice how the text is in red up there, right? 
You know, if you just click up here on where it says red letter, then all the words when they're actually spoken by Christ, just like you would have in your Bible. Took me forever to figure that one out. <laughs> <laughs> just one of those things that sometimes we forget. Okay, so uh, Revelation 3, 16. So because you're lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Uh, Let's look this up here. Emeo. <laughs> the uh, King James Version translates it, and it's only used one time, so it's right here, right? Spew. Okay. Uh, Strong's definition, uh, email of uncertain affinity to vomit. I, I think we probably did that, probably uh, made uh, spit and not use the word vomit because maybe we thought that was a little bit... Uh, 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 too crude a uh, uh, word. Uh, however, I, I just don't want you to miss the meaning here. When do you spit something out of your mouth? Whenever you want. Whenever that feeling happens, you. No, no, I'm, really. It doesn't have to be something distasteful. I just spit anytime you want. But now explain to me about vomiting. Yes. Sometimes. Something is not agreeable. Your body is rejecting something, right? Something is not going hand in hand. Something, and so your body, because it is not in agreement with your body. So now with that in mind, explain to me why Christ, did he just said, you know what, I just decided I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. He's going to go, he's no. hurl it. <laughs> is it because it's not in concert with him? Is it because it's not in line with righteousness and holiness and so forth? So lukewarmness is totally contrary with the character of God. All right, ladies, help me out here. I say ladies because we, we guys, we're not, usually we're not wired to, to express ourselves all that well uh, at times. Uh, do you want a husband that loves you lukewarmly? Tell me about, what it, when you see the word lukewarm, what does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I, I, I love it. We, we guys, we have to get scientific and, uh, and, and, you know, lukewarm, he says it's in the middle. <laughs> I turn my faucets ha halfway. It's, uh, I'm going to give you a word and see if this makes sense to you. Lukewarm, spiritually speaking, is the same as the word indifferent. Does it make sense? Like wishy-washy, you could take it or leave it. Okay. You could take it or leave it. I'm trying to help you understand why it is that this is so detestable to the Lord. I mean, the spiritual state that he is saying, I would rather deal with someone that is lost than someone who is just lukewarm, with someone that is indifferent. Is it starting to make sense? Yes, Don. Keep coming back. I keep coming back to when these people come up to Christ and say, uh, "I did all these things for you." Right. And he says, "Depart from me. I never knew you." I never knew you. Yeah. Now that would be more a state of lukewarmness. No, I, I, the only reason I would say no is because there is no genuine faith. He says, I never knew you. In order to get to lukewarm, you had to have been cold. Some heat has got, been applied. There was an initial, you know, belief and fervor and so forth. And now you have, okay, you haven't been on guard. You haven't been watching. You haven't been. Okay, so if you don't take care of your marriage, if you don't see to it that, that you do the right things and you don't get to know, okay, you guys know about the five love languages and I need to, I need to okay, how do I need to uh, uh, appeal to my wife? How do I need to meet her needs and so forth? And I spend time getting to know. I may not get it right, but you know what she appreciates? She appreciates the effort that I'm putting forth. And then she might correct me. You know, and I'm okay with the correcting. You know why? Because I want to get it right. I want to get it right. Why? Because she means everything to me. And even if you don't, you're still married. And even if you don't, you're still married. Hopefully, yes. And so, but no, the, so, 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 so the point being that 
lukewarm. So in that case, when he said, I never knew you, we are talking about someone who has played the religious game, but they never actually had a relationship with the Lord. And that's why he says, I never knew you. The word never is so strong there because he said, there never was a time when you and I did, okay? But lukewarm, the danger of what's happening in Laodicea is that they have neglected their faith. They've been so distracted by the worldly things that are around them, their affluence and so forth, that they got to the point where like, you know what? This level of Christianity is okay with me right now. You know, I read my two chapters a day. You know, uh, I have my five-minute prayer at the end of the day. You know, I go to church on Sundays. Uh, I even... The person in Don's example is the person who thinks they can get, earn their way into heaven. They don't, they don't recognize the sacrifice as being their only way into heaven. They, they think... All I've got to do is give some money to some charities or, or work at a charity. Do these good things. I earn my way into heaven. Yes, I'm good enough. You know, there is some similarities, though, Don, and, and there, there are some. And the reason I say there's similarities is because when you get to the point that you, you came to, to, to faith by grace, but you're trying to maintain it by deeds and thinking that your deeds are enough. Now you've lost your focus and your, and your love. And so try to explain love and lukewarmness. They really are not compatible. They're not compatible at all. Let me give you another word that is absolutely incompatible with lukewarmness. Faith. Can you tell me that you truly understand, and you, you just alluded to it, Kathy. Can you truly say that you understand the cost to God the Father, His only begotten Son, and Jesus Christ, taking on human flesh. When we talk about the humiliation of Christ. By the way, remember, when, and this is going back to one of our earlier studies, when he first said in chapter 1 that he saw one like a son of man. And so we spent that entire study looking at the son of man. Because Jesus Christ was not always the son of man. He became the son of man. And now we see him in eternity as the son of man. We saw him glorified, and what did he still have? Scars on his hands, wound in his side, and so he will be the son of man for all eternity. Do you understand the cost to bring salvation to you and me? Can you truly understand that and then just be lukewarm about it? Your faith is dying if you stay in that state right there. So it's not that Jesus Christ, now tell me, is God any less God if you and I don't worship him? No. Is he any more God if you and I do worship him? No. He is the eternal what? I am. He is not lacking in anything. Right? So when Jesus says, I wish, and that he hates it and is disagreeable with him, why? Because he loves us. Because then he'll go on to say, I, I, I reprove and I discipline the ones that I love. Uh, why do you think he dislikes being lukewarm? What's the danger of lukewarmness? Falling away. Uh, falling away? Uh, so tell me, how victorious are you going to live a Christian life if you're living in a state of lukewarmness? Tell me about the abundant life you're going to be living. Tell me about the fruit of the Spirit, the peace and the joy and so forth. Are you going to tell me that you're really living in those things if you're living in a state of lukewarmness? So all of the fullness of God has for all the victories that God has for you and for me, can you receive those in, in the state of lukewarmness? He'll withhold his blessings from us. If, if well, it's totally contrary, yeah. And so he, 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 so because of his love for you and me, he's like, I, I want you to understand, don't be in a state of lukewarmness because you're robbing yourself of all the goodness of God. So the scriptures say, taste and see that the Lord is good. Man, you know, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longest after thee. When you get to that point, in a state of lukewarmness, you're not going to receive those blessings. You're just kind of just spinning your, your you're that hamster on, that, on, 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 the, on the little wheel. They're just going in, in one place and, and you think that everything's okay. You've mistaken your earthly comforts for spiritual blessings. 
and you think that God's favor is upon you and you've been deceived and the Lord Jesus Christ is saying, lukewarmness makes me sick. Why? Because you don't know what you're depriving yourself of, the riches of the goodness of God. You don't get to experience those. Why? Because you're not seeking me. I would much rather someone who is completely lost it's so hard for us to convince ourselves that we are in need when we look around and we're, oh, wait a second, I got everything I need and everything, and everything is just hunky-dory. You know, I don't, I don't, uh, and we don't, so it's hard if I stay in that state of lukewarm just to get someone to come up to me and say, hey, Brother Carlos, I need to talk to you. Man, it, it, it looks like your, your fire's dying out, you know, you, you don't care anymore. I mean, there's, there's no, and I'm like, oh, come on, man, everything's okay. That's right, I'm good, I'm good. The Lord Jesus Christ said, no, you're not good. You're not good. You think you are. And when we come back next week, we'll see, man, when he begins to tear this apart and he begins to tell them exactly what it is that, 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 that they are lacking. Uh, absolutely not to be lukewarm. Any comments on, on, on lukewarmness? Be thinking about what he says to them uh, because the Lord Jesus Christ now will reiterate to them the statement that they themselves are making about themselves. Probably publicly when people are talking about the church in Laodicea. Look what he says. Because you say. That's what he says. He goes, because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Uh, I think I may have told you uh, last week as well. Uh, but look at the statement I am rich and have become wealthy. It almost sounds like, a, like, he's, like he's making a redundant statement. I am rich and have become wealthy. Look at that and, and see what you come up with because they're absolutely two separate things. Uh, and it's an absolutely wonderful point. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, how the church in America or Western, the Western church, to our shame, resembles the church in Laodicea way, way too well. Way too well. Any questions or comments on today? Well, I praise you guys. Thank you. I mean, that, that, you guys have blessed me. I've had such a good time. I, I told you, man, the church in Laodicea is it's so many good lessons in, in the church in Laodicea. Um, and uh, start looking. Uh, you should be reading uh, uh, on ahead as well, chapter 4. Uh, because we're going to move into the next phase of the revelation. And now John will be translated into heaven into the throne room of God. And uh, start looking. Start looking at those 24 elders. Start looking at those four living uh, beings. Uh, start looking at the throne. Uh, don't forget the rainbow. Okay? Look at the rainbow and what that means. Uh, it, it'll be a blessing. Anyways, let's, let's close in a word. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much uh, that you've allotted us this time uh, to study your holy word, sacred word. Father God, you have so much for us. I pray that you give us uh, a hunger and a desire to draw closer to you. Father, to be obedient to the things that you show us. Father God, that uh, you revealed uh, uh, the truth to us. That Father God, we want perverted or, uh, uh, or twisted in any shape, form, or fashion. Father, the, the, the truth that you give us will share with others uh, that they too can come. And, and Father God, uh, be in your presence as well. We give you thanks and praise. We pray for the remainder of this week and all the things that we'll come across and the decisions that we have to make. Uh, Father God, grant us the divine wisdom to respond in a way that brings honor and glory to your name. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.